So, we are very glad to have uh, Professor Zhe Xiang Li to give a talk here. Uh, I think Zhe Xiang is one of the best uh, researchers in manipulation in the world. Uh, he did his undergraduate here, and he did his master and PhD in Berkeley. And he's now a professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, he I, he did some very impressive work in grasping like how to optimize the faucet according to the utilities of objects. And uh, he wrote some books uh, like uh, Mathematical Introduction to uh, Robotic Manipulation. And uh, this, is, this was written together with Professor uh, Richard Murray and Professor Sestri. He also had a book on non-hydronomic motion planning together with John Kenny. Uh, he not only worked on in academia, he also started his own business. Uh, he has a company named Google. And the company basically does uh, make uh, robot controllers and uh, uh, basic robotic models. So I, today's talk will be from geometry to startups and ready of a new robotic industry in China. So I think we will not only hear about the uh, his research, uh, the mathematics of robotics, but we will also know about the recent development of Chinese uh, robotic industry. So we will see. Uh, thanks, Wei, for the uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back again. Okay, so when I was uh, first come here as an undergraduate student in 1979. That was the time the Robotics Institute was uh, established. And uh, my last trip to here was uh, 1992, and uh, I you know, had a difficulty to explain what is a leap bracket to Matt and a group of students in the manipulation lab. And uh, it is uh, such a you know, wonderful experience to be back again 20 years later and they see that uh, you know, the institute has grown up so much. So many wonderful things and also you know, geometry, geometric tools are being utilized uh, and lots of pioneers in this uh, area, okay, in almost uh, all aspects of uh, robotics. Okay? So I'm going to... Uh, 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 give a talk about uh, some of the things that uh, we tried to do and also of course uh, many people tried to do that is to geometrize uh, lots of the problems in robotics okay so I will first uh, give uh, a list of those problems which I'm sure you are very familiar with and they also describe some of the history you know, in the attempt to geometrize those uh, problems, okay? And I know Professor, uh, you know... You forgot the name already. Yeah, Koshi, yeah. Uh, uh, had a course uh, in this aspect, and I just, he just went through with me that uh, he did all those tools in one week. Okay, so that was incredible. Okay, and he said he had uh, seven students in his uh, class. So to be clear, we don't go through that material all in a week. We just go through some highlights that are able to understand the follow-on <coughs> kinematics and locomotion that happens afterwards. Okay, terrific. Our students are great, but they're... Yeah. So I will take about five minutes to basically <laughs> uh, <laughs> go, go through this uh, uh, basic uh, tools. And uh, then I will describe you know, you know, tools uh, you put in the investment, right? These are your investment. You like to see the return on investment. Okay, so you will see that, uh, you know, the investment is really great. Okay, you can take uh, benefits from the use of those tools to develop highly efficient algorithm. Your software was so much more compact that give you, you know, advantage when you start up companies to develop uh, products, okay? And they also that, uh, you know, some of the big opportunities and also grand challenges, okay, 
of a new robotic uh, industry that uh, we are trying to develop, okay, also rests on the foundation of those uh, tools. And I just uh, had a talk with uh, Professor Blum, okay, and she is also together with the Robotics Institute you know, to start the incubation center, and I said that there are lots of opportunities for collaboration between you know, the great uh, programs here and they also because they, we have uh, you know, recently or uh, over the last uh, 30 years built a infrastructure that can make things at high quality and also inexpensive. Okay, so that is a basic, uh, you know, what I like to talk about. Okay, so I have uh, lots of uh, problems which you are all very familiar. Okay, so the first area is to understand rigid body motions, right? The kinematics, trajectory, generation, dynamics, the stability under control, those can be go on, you know, a long list. <coughs> And the, the other problem or area of problems, uh, you know, robot manipulators, right? If you want to understand the kinematics, dynamics, the inverse control, blah, 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 and also hybrid control, right? Those are all geometric problems. And they also when you, you know, uh, in, the, in the lab, I just went to manipulation with the multi-finger hands, right? So the kinematics of contact and the grasp model force optimization, all those are, you know, geometric in nature. And also parallel manipulators, right, from the classical four-bar linkage to a multi-degree of freedom spatial parallel manipulators. So we have those analysis, dynamics, control, but most importantly, how do you systematically synthesize such kind of structure okay, in a geometric uh, uh, manner? And also biomechanics, okay, we always want to model the human shoulder joints, which is a uh, you know, marvelous uh, mechanism, okay, and there are lots of uh, you know, misinterpretation of the human shoulder joints existed. And also we like to model the eyeball movement, and they also you know, model you know, how a cat falling down can turn itself upside down. Okay, so those are also you know, you know, problems of a similar nature modeling analysis and then planning control synthesis. And also in machine design, for example, you know, parallel structure for five axis machine tools. And in the uh, automobile design, a critical component is the CV joints, right, which transmit velocity of the motor to velocity of the wheel at an arbitrary configuration of the wheel, right, so that is the CV joints, and each car has uh, multiple number of such of joints. And we have the zipper joints, we have the Thomson joints, okay, so how do we understand and model those, okay. And they also that uh, in manufacturing, you know, the, 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 if you look at the joint, how do you machine a part with quality? The thing that you control quality is through tolerance specification, right? And those are now described in graphic language. They are not precise, not geometric. Okay, that leads to lots of problems. Can we geometrize uh, those uh, problems so that the verification can be precise and accurate? Okay, because that is critical for production of iPhone, iPads, and also those uh, gadgets. Okay. And also in that, uh, you know, we have to localize the workpiece, you know, to set it up to machine. So workpiece localization, regular shape, symmetric shape, partially machined piece, okay. So those problems are, are all pretty geometric, robot calibration. Okay, so I have a list of problems, and I'm sure that you also have a lot of problems that you're working on. And so um, with all those problems, so we try to provide a unified tool for their analysis. Not, uh, you know, uh, for each category of a problem, you develop a set of uh, tools and you cannot cut across, okay? So the, game is, uh, the aim is to develop a tool we can unify the modeling analysis and the design of those uh, gadgets, okay? So here is uh, a little background of uh, the great, uh, you know, uh, 
people that uh, allow us to understand those issues. Of course, uh, the first is the Euclidean geometry and the Euclidean space, right? And the Euclid, uh, in his uh, fifth postulate of the elements, uh, you know, precisely formulated what is uh, Euclidean space, okay? And they, of course, the Descartes, you know, establish coordinates so you can translate uh, the description into algebra, right, which you can manipulate, you can, you know, do calculation. And they, then Newton established a calculus on the space of Euclidean space, right? So that is all great, and we know how to deal with all those problems. And of course, the first example of non-Euclidean space, right, that was uh, and a couple of uh, you know Russian and the uh, Hungarian mathematician, but I think it was finally Gauss that put everything into perspective. And they, of course, uh, his. Uh, um, post our remand, generalize that from one, two dimension to higher dimensions. And of course, uh, notations that we use today is due to Hermann Weyl, right? And they, of course, S.S. Chen, he established the math department at UC Berkeley, and they trained the generations of geometers that we benefit today. So those are the classical reference and the books that uh, if you are interested in this tool, I know that uh, you know, Professor here has his textbook as well, okay? Huh? <laughs> okay, so um, there are a number of uh, uh, control robotics uh, engineers that try to benefit from this tool, right? And of course, uh, Roger Brackett is the pioneer, okay, in bring in the tool first to the area of control and then into robotics and the computer vision, okay? And Shankar Sastry, my former advisor at UC Berkeley, you know, took uh, you know, that tool and they to Berkeley and they also, you know, Brockett had a number of wonderful PhD students in Montana, Frank Park, and they paid them from Berkeley Murray, my you know, collaborator, and the professor Vijay Kumar, and I know that a uh, number of names here which uh, should uh, go on. So apologize uh, for not uh, being able to update this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, the, there are some more information. We run a couple of, you know, in addition to my regular teaching to graduate and undergraduate students, uh, we also conducted uh, a number of uh, summer schools to promote this. So the first one is at the Technical University of Braunschweig, and I encounter a geometer from, this is the former school of Gauss, okay? So one of the professor in the math department uh, uh, patent with me to develop uh, the geometric tool so that it becomes accessible to engineers, okay? And then a couple of times in China. So we have uh, a, on the lecture notes, okay, all, you know, uh, produced and stored in the website, which you can take a look. Uh, so, okay, so I will take five minutes, okay? So hold on your breath and uh, to go through the basic tools with a couple of examples so you get uh, the basic idea. Okay, I know that at least seven of those students, they are very well educated and uh, I will just uh, for the other group who didn't take a professor's course, okay? So you, you know. Uh, okay, so this, uh, um, let's basically go through you know, what, uh, you know, we typically do when we have uh, problems uh, in Euclidean space, right? It is uh, through Newton, Leibniz, who developed the calculus, right? So application of a calculus in engineering studied with, uh, you know, Munch, okay, at uh, Eco Polytechnic, okay? So all those uh, engineering problems, right? When you model it, you use a simplification approximation, uh, so it becomes a problem in the Euclidean space, right? A function in the Euclidean space that you wish to optimize. And to do that, you need to take advantage of the properties of this Euclidean space, right? What are the properties? We all know from multivariable calculus, right? You use a single coordinates to describe every point in the space one-to-one, -one, right? So every point, you know, this one single coordinates enough. And it has a linear structure, right? 
And they also, this space, which uh, you know, parallel postulates in Euclid uh, of uh, you know, the elements. So it says, you know, every, uh, which translates into several equivalent versions, you can deduce, right? Either parallel line axiom or the sum of three interior triangles adds up to 180 degrees, right? And the curvature, the metric, okay, you have a zero curvature, and the geodesic between any two points is unique, right, given by a straight line. So those are all those uh, properties of the Euclidean space. So when it comes to minimize a function on Euclidean space, you make use of those properties, right? So, well, you search for critical points, right? How do you do that? And of course, uh, then if, uh, to determine if the critical points is minimum or maximum, you look at the hashing of the function, right? If uh, positive definite, uh, maximum or negative definite, blah, blah, blah. And uh, to look for the extreme points, you have to compute the directional derivative through that point, right? And uh, to compute the directional derivative, you have to find a path going through that point in that direction. So you have to utilize the property of the Euclidean space to do that, we are all familiar with, okay? So, okay, now the five minutes comes. So what is a non-Euclidean space, okay? I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? So, and of course, uh, you know, in Gauss, you know, his definition, it is a space we can model beauty, curved space, right? Okay, so if we want to model a model, right? <laughs> you need a curved space, not flat space, right? So here, a example that you are familiar with, so a sphere, the Earth, right? So how do you describe a point on Earth? Well, you have to set up coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, right? So you use the latitude and the longitude angle to locate a point on the surface of Earth, right? Okay, so if you feel that is the longitude latitude angle. So every point here is described by a point in the surface, okay? Most of the points, except singularity of the parameterization. North Pole, South Pole, and the meridian line connecting North Pole to South Pole. That is the singularity of the parameterization, right? So one coordinate is not enough to describe every point on Earth, right? So you need another coordinate. So this is your first coordinate. So you have to turn your surface or your Earth around, introducing another coordinate, which we call, you know, phi two, okay? Hopefully the singularity of phi two is disjoint from that of phi one, okay? And you also want to make sure for points that is neither in the singularity of this and for that, so you have two descriptions, right? Two sets of coordinates for the same point. So you need to change coordinates, right? From one description to another description. So you want the change of coordinates from the red one to the yellow one to be smooth or differentiable, okay, function, okay? And you want to add enough coordinates so that they cover the whole sphere. In this case, only two suffice, okay? So all such coordinates, uh, you know, you collect them, give you a differentiable structure, okay? So a manifold is just the sphere together with a differentiable structure, that's all, okay? So, and they, give a couple of applications I saw in Professor you know's uh, textbook, your new book, right? So, okay, a RN is obviously a good example that we are familiar with. And uh, if you are working with a two degree of freedom manipulator, the configuration space is a two copy of S1, right? Rotation group, right? So a Donut, okay, so that is a two-dimensional manifold, okay. And if you are working with a six degree of freedom 
manipulator or revolver joints. This is a six-dimensional torus. That is also a differentiable manifold. And they, of course, those manifolds are easy to visualize. They are also abstract manifolds that may take you a few more minutes to understand. Okay, so let's, for example, consider the unit sphere. Okay, and if you identify the antipodal points, okay, or if you take the line through the origin, all to be equivalent. Okay. So that is uh, a one-dimensional manifold, which we call the real projective space of dimension one, okay, RP1. And the, another example is you look at the unit sphere, identify the antipodal points, okay, also lines through the origin, you identify them as a single point, that is RP2, okay, real projective space of dimension two. Okay. I will come to this, why we need those uh, two abstract space, they are quite useful. Okay, so, you know, uh, manifold is a very general definition. Lots of things fit into that, okay. And uh, there's a class of manifolds, okay, that has additional structure that we can explore. That is the Lie group, okay. So we all know when we describe the orientation of a rigid body, right? We write this as a rotation matrix, and it has the property it is orthogonal and the determinant equal to one. So this is a subset inside a nine-dimensional space, a curved space in the nine-dimensional space. And it has the property you can multiply them, they are again closed, and it has the identity, has the inverse, right? So it is closed under group operation, okay? And those two operations are comparable. In other words, those are smooth operations under the group structure and the manifold structure, okay? So a Lie group is just a algebraic group together with a manifold with compatible structure, okay? So why we want to do this, okay, another example, the general linear group, all those non-singular matrices of, uh, you know, dimension n by n, and the, the special Euclidean group that you deal with every day, right? Homogeneous matrices of those form. So all those are Lie groups, okay? And the advantage of Lie group, as we said, is that we have a natural parameterization. Because we, you know, a manifold, you have lots of coordinates to choose from, which is a problem. We want something, you have only one choice, and it is a symbol, okay? So for a, you know, group, you have uh, so-called the tangent space, the approximation to the identity, okay? That has a certain structure, which is a Lie algebra, which I will not go through it. And then you have a, you know, for the rotation group, the tangent space at identity are those uh, three by three skew symmetric matrices, okay? And we have a exponent, okay, so for the special Euclidean group, those are the twists, right, that you are familiar with. And we have an exponential map from the Lie algebra to the group level, right, which provides a way to coordinate the group Okay, to coordinate the group. And these are the rotation about a particular axis. And the, in the case of SE3, are the screw motions, right, that uh, we are familiar with. Okay, so if uh, you have a vector space, you have subspace, right? You have a father, then you have a son. Okay, so the analogy here, if you have a group, then you have subgroups, okay. So subgroup of the special Euclidean group are ex extremely important in variety of robotics problems, okay. They are only finite, you know, nine subgroups of SE3, of various dimension which you should uh, be familiar with. And the first one is the rotation about pretty you know, a given axis, revolute joints, right? This is a subgroup. 
And the, you know, those uh, six lower pairs we are familiar with given by the rotation, translation, Herrick, cylindrical, planar, and also rotation group, right? So there are six here which correspond to the lower pairs we are familiar with. And the, you know, there are certain subsets that does not admit group structure, you know, have a little less structure, but yet nowadays are still important. Those are submanifolds of a Lie group. A particular example is the universal joints, okay? You have a rotation about two orthogonal axes. If you're writing it down, it's a product of two exponential, okay? Those are not closed under group operation. Elements in here, if you multiply them, they fell off, right? You're producing twisting motion. So this is a two-dimensional submanifold, okay? Uh, for the second kind, okay? And uh, they are also, and of course you can prove this is diffeomorphic to the two-dimensional torus, okay? It's a two-dimensional torus. And uh, there is another, okay? Two-dimensional submanifold of S03, given by the exponential of a two-dimensional subspace, okay, which has a, a certain property called the, the triple system, okay, not closed under the brackets, but under the double brackets, okay. And if you look at our eyeball, it's a mechanism, okay. If you look at the mechanism of the eyeball, it is in fact given by this model, not that model. Okay, so that is important. Otherwise, if you look at the people, you will twist in your eye. Okay, so that looks weird. <laughs> and the, that space uh, is uh, very diffeomorphic to the real projective space of dimension two. Okay, so RP2 actually is a model of your eyeball. Okay, so to put it that way. And if you look at five-axis machine, okay, you know, because when it comes to five-axis machine, things get extremely complicated compared to three-axis machine. That is because the configuration space of a five-axis machine is given by the quotient of SO3 by a symmetry that is the spindle symmetry, okay? So that is a different morphic to RP2 as well, okay? And the, the coordinates of a second kind, uh, recently we discovered a number of uh, useful applications, okay, as a model space for lots of mechanisms uh, that are extremely difficult to describe, okay. We mentioned the eyeball is exponential uh, for, you know, E4, E4, E5, okay. So if you take the first uh, three as a translation, the last three as a rotation, okay. So exponential of a two-dimensional subspace is the eyeball, and the exponential of uh, Another two-dimensional subspace, E3, E4, actually gives you a knee joint. And the shoulder joints, okay, your shoulder joints, you know, people try to approximate to use the SO3 joint, but that is totally wrong. Because uh, if that way you get lots of singularity, you cannot, you know, scratch the back of your arm, okay? You cannot scratch your back. So that is the exponential of E3, E4, E5, okay? So that is the shoulder joint, CV joints is also three, four, and five, okay? Five axis machine is that, okay, yeah. So E3 is Z, E4 is theta X, E5 is theta Y? Yeah, in the fixed axis. In the so so E1, E2, E3 are the three translations. Four and five, six are rotations about those fixed axis. So, so, so the Z is, this is the motion? For yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. And this is not a, this is not a rotation? Uh, it's a rotation plus, uh, you know, sort of uh, dependent translation. Oh, I, 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 see, I see. Yeah. So the, you know, center of rotation shifts. Okay. So that gives uh, a, you know, accurate description, honest description of your shoulder joints. And your wrist is the same? And the wrist? Is the wrist also? No, the wrist uh, is, uh, we didn't do careful study of this. Uh, probably this is SO3, more closely modeled. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I will try to sort of uh, 
I give a little, uh, okay, so, you know, manifolds has uh, various uh, different kinds, okay. With that, you can have, this is not a rigorous mathematical classification, okay, only from the engineering perspective, how we classify this uh, generic manifold into some finer structure, okay. Euclidean space, which we are familiar with, uh, Lie group, we are also some kind of, you know, somewhat familiar with, and also a manif sub manifold with a remaining structure, and also homogeneous space, which is uh, we saw a couple of examples of it. So I will go through a little bit of uh, each, give you a couple of examples so you have a few ideas. So if the sphere, you impose a you know, metric, you can measure the distance between two points on the Earth, right? So you can you know, uh, define a metric, okay? Just the induced metric, and if you have a metric together with the manifold, you have a remaining manifold. Allow you to measure distance, and you can define parallel transport. You can differentiate the vector fields along, okay, you know, directions. You can define parallel transport. You can define geodesic. So lots of things that you can do as you do in. Euclidean space, okay? And one example, the geodesic is arcs of a great circle, right? And of course, uh, what is the metric? Well, we have a God-given metric, okay? For example, for a six degree of a freedom robot, the metric is just the kinetic energy, right? So using that metric on the six dimensional torus, you can define the geodesic equation, that is just the, the Lagrangian equation. And if a rigid body SE3, you have a metric given by the rotation and the translation of kinetic energy. And the Newton Euler equations are just the, the you know, uh, geodesic equations there, which you can have a global description of the rigid body dynamics. No need to parameterize using those, uh, you know, Euler angles, blah, 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 which is only local, okay? So I think Frank Park and his uh, uh, students, and you can also extend that to hybrid control of uh, any manipulators, okay? A completely geometric setting, and the control algorithm, proof of stability, all come down so natural and easily. So I will not go through that detail, it's in the reference. And if you want to grasp an object using your fingers, okay, of course you have to model the grasp, and you have the friction that you model off of this, you know, here is famous for developing the friction models, right? And of course, in the old days, we tried to linearize the friction cone. And the, you know, in the traditional way, but you're making the problem much more complex and difficult, impossible to solve the force optimization in real time. Okay. So another approach is to go through another space, which is the space of symmetric positive definite matrices, which is itself a remaining manifold. And in that space, all the constraint disappeared, and you can impose a function that, uh, you know, because it has a remaining metric, uh, simply the trace of two symmetric matrices, and they impose a function that, uh, you know, minimization of which will allow you to minimize your forces, at the same time stay away from the boundary of the friction cone. And this is a convex problem. You can develop uh, the gradient algorithm and the solving the problem extremely fast in real time. Okay, so those are the papers. And they, of course, uh, you know, the application in formulation, the kinematics and the, the dynamics of open chain manipulator. You no longer need the DH parameterization, which uh, it would drive you crazy, okay, you know. I had, uh, you know, I got it right first time. Every time I come back to, I forgot. Just like I forgot the professor's name, okay. <laughs> So I think uh, some new approach, it is easy to remember, is needed, okay. So if, uh, you know, the kinematics forward is a product of exponential, the exponent is so easy to write down just by inspection, okay. And uh, you can do the Jacobian, the inverse kinematics and prove the optimal workspace, okay. 
So you can also extend this to the dynamics formulation that was done by Frank Park. Okay, you can have ON algorithm, right? So that is the easiest, I mean, the most efficient algorithm. And then you can factorize the dynamics every term, the inertia, the Coriolis matrix into terms that depends on the joint angle, that depends on the parameter of those. So when you design the optimal control or any adaptive control, you know, you can take advantage of the structure that you obtain through this formulation. Okay, so that is the 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 advantage, and they also you know you have a cat you you know lift it up and you drop it at the upside down configuration, and you will see the cat is so smart to land on her feet, right? So how does a cat in middle air change her orientation? subject to angular momentum constraint. So this can also be formulated as a you know, optimization problem in two copies of the rotation group. You write down the angular momentum, set up the constraint, and the control the cat has is the relative motion of the upper body with respect to the lower body. So you have a nonlinear control problem defined on a lead group, right? And you use the group structure, and then you can solve the reorientation problem of a falling cat. So I know that uh, you know to explain homogeneous space is always difficult. In addition to the five minutes, you need probably a couple more. But uh, this is a systematic uh, formulation of that space. You know, given a Lie group. If uh, you have a subgroup H, and uh, then it has, uh, uh, you know, the action, you know, a subgroup, you can, you know, left translate that subgroup to left or right, and identify all those points if they lie on the same orbit. Okay, so that is the idea, and uh, you take every point to be a single point, you have the homogeneous space, okay? So roughly this space is a manifold, not a group, okay? Has a dimension, Dimension of G minus H, so that is easy to do counting. Okay, and the, here is the one application. Okay, if you want to localize a regular object, this is the optimization problem in SE three. But what if you want to localize a cylinder? Right, a cylinder has a symmetry. Rotate about the axis, translating about the axis leaves the cylinder unchanged. Right? So you have to quotient the symmetry of the cylinder. Okay. This is a finite cylinder, so it has only rotation symmetry, but the infinite cylinder have a two-dimensional symmetry. So take the quotient, it's the configuration space of a symmetric object. So the model space is very easy to obtain. And you can you know, formulate the workpiece localization problem for symmetric feature or non-symmetric feature as a least square problem in either SE3 if there are no symmetry, or in the symmetric space or the homogeneous space if there are symmetry. Okay, so everything utilizing the exponential coordinates, uh, you know, the line of coding is so compressed. And the you know five-axis machine. Now you have uh, a universal description of uh, its configuration space, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, time of uh, constraints. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing is uh, you know if you look at uh, the you know design of. Uh, a part so that the bang that he often goes through, you know, he write down those tolerance notions. Okay, you know, it's all case by case graphic. Okay, it will drive you crazy. Bang is okay. You know, he is so familiar with all those. Okay, and so how do you make this mathematical and precise? So the formulation is again, you know, uh, some minimax problem in the homogeneous space, okay? So once you realize that, you know, everything, because if you look at the NC standard, you know, about a book of that thick, in order to understand it, will probably take you a semester, okay? So there are all kinds of cases of those, okay? And of course, uh, they were committees, okay, probably 100 people try to formulate this as a mathematical problem. But they used the wrong mathematics, they use vector calculus, okay? 
So, you know, it is so unfortunate because of these uh, geometric tools are not accessible to mechanical engineers. So it took them a long way to do it, and in the end, it's case-by-case -case basis, and they incorrect. And here, the symmetry group of all those features, you can easily write down, right? Okay, for a center circle in E2, this O2, straight line in E2, T1, blah, blah, blah. All these symmetric features has a symmetry subgroup. And the quotient of that is the configuration space of those uh, symmetric features. And it involves only seven subgroups, okay? And all those uh, flatness, uh, straightness, all those, uh, you know, uh, formulations can be formulated as a minimax problem in those uh, homogeneous uh, spaces. And the line of code, we did everything, less than 100 lines. Okay, you don't need to use the least square. You don't need to address each of those problems separately. Okay, so it is uh, so much more efficient. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the Clavis delta mechanism is uh, such an ingenious invention. And I spoke to him and, uh, you know, he had lots of experience to come up with uh, such a structure. How do you systematically, for example, a fresh graduate student with uh, you know, 40 minutes of uh, uh, you know, lecture from your professor or from here can systematically come up with this structure or many similar structure. So we have done work to you know, look at the synthesis of such a mechanism. So the first step is to synthesize the legs. Okay, and the interconnection of these legs will give you the resulting structure. But how do you describe the leg motion type. So you can use uh, you know, the products of uh, two subgroups with non-trivial intersection. Okay, so those are a class of uh, manifolds that uh, introduced uh, by Professor uh, Hervé of, uh, I think, uh, Eco uh, Paris 6 or 7. He retired already. But uh, using the traditional probably B group theory of the 30s. Okay. But, uh, you know, we had a paper to show you, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of this product, you can automatically synthesize all possible topologies of a mechanism. So you no longer need, uh, you know, 30 years of experience or intuition to do that. Okay, so, okay, this uh, I can take it. Uh, how is my timing? Huh? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, good, I love, okay. So the next uh, lecture is uh, how do you go from here? You know, you publish a paper, you get your thesis, right? But you shouldn't stop here. So how do you take this uh, to, uh, to, you know, develop a product and they also do companies with it? So this is uh, some of the effort that uh, our group uh, did. Okay, so let me quickly. So this, of course, uh, the, my, of course, uh, Larry Page, this is uh, from dorm, porch, garage to park, right? We are all familiar with everybody is trying to think of. And so we developed the controller for the hand manipulating object, but that is uh, not going to make you rich, right? So somehow, you know, there's a company in China, you know, they imported a machine and then with a Japanese controller, they cannot get it to work. So finally, the guy come to me and say, Professor, can you do me a favor? You know, I said, I only write papers. I only work on the groups. Uh, what can I do for you? <laughs> so anyway, we, you know, used our controller controlling the robot manipulating to fit his controller. It worked and that gave us some great inspiration. And and then we realized that, uh, you know, at that time, the Chinese model of manufacturing is you take order, you buy equipment from Japan, US, and Germany, you set up a factory quickly, right? So um, <clears throat> this model is not going to continue forever. The labor is going to rise, and all cost, costs are going to rise. So ultimately, China needed to develop its own machinery industry. And what do we need? You want to do that. We need the critical technology. So we need a controller. So that was the motivation of the first uh, um, company that uh, we studied. It is called the Google. Okay? And in fact, we registered the name several months before this Google. Okay. 
So uh, th this is uh, now our own park, okay, headquarter, and the, now uh, all kinds of controllers that uh, uh, we developed for various level. And you can see that uh, the machinery industry in China, you know, take off uh, in 2005, and uh, you can see from the growth, and we have about 50 percent of the market share in China. And also, this allowed me to, you know, come back to design curriculum and also re-exam the courses, what we teach to the students, so they can go along this way. Okay. So I also, you know, establish something very similar to the robotic academy and also the courses developed here. In fact, I get a lot of help from professors here. Okay, to develop those courses, and the one for the course is a robot competition class and allow students to work together and they design robots to engage in competition and they have to go to Shenzhen to make a PCB to do the mechanical and also buy components so they get familiar with the supply chain in China okay so one of the company you know okay one Tao is a you know undergraduate student and then later on as a graduate student with me and he wants to you know design a controller for helicopter at that time to control a helicopter Helicopter takes a long time, so that was his first effort, and then he continued to improve, and then you know controller for motor rotor, and then he has uh, you know products that uh, you know everything you know the UAV, the camera, everything built into. So that is uh, some of the reports, and they also the company. You know, went I think over the last three years by 80 times, 80x you know growth, and now it's about 1,500 employee. It's the biggest company of that kind globally, and actually I can probably show you briefly a video what we took when we visited Stanford campus using the everything integrated. Uh, you know, we just uh, made a short stop and then take a video of the Stanford campus using the small UAV. You can see, you know, with the gimbal stabilized, uh, this is uh, no post processing at all. Okay, so anything you can carry in your pocket, anywhere you go, you see a nice, beautiful scenery, you simply, you know, do it. Okay, so everything is, uh, you know, so uh, simple to use. Okay, so let me continue. And the, the second, uh, the third startup is by a group of uh, students that, uh, you know, actually the name of the company is Lee Group. <laughs> Automation, okay, so you can see the tribute to this. It's really in the, you know, the, all the automobile industry are developed out of, uh, I mean, all the robot industries are developed out of uh, automobile. Okay, but uh, recently in China, the 3C industry, you know, the making of uh, iPhone, iPads, uh, smartphones, and this is a big industry. And uh, all those existing robots become inapplicable for the task for the 3C industry. Okay, I know Foxconn is, uh, you know, getting a project here that is exactly that, uh, you know, what uh, we are doing over there. <laughs> So uh, this is a little, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, roadmap. You know, we do study research here at the Hong Kong University of Science Technology and the startups, and now finally we have uh, a science park that is very well, you know, um, conceived, and the lots of companies are starting up uh, there as well. So I'm going to give you a few words in next. Uh, uh, a uh, few minutes. What I see the opportunities are. Okay, first in terms of industry robots. Okay, so here is just what I said. This is the growth of the automobile industry globally, right? So the first. Uh, okay, so probably 1950, quantity reached five million in the U.S. Right, and the, the first industry robots 1961. And of course, for the next uh, 20 some years, the U.S. Uh, dominated uh, the industry robots uh, 
uh, community and also the components. Because without the components, you cannot do that. Okay. And then Japan took uh, about uh, probably starting some time here, developing first the components industry. And then the robot companies uh, like Yasukawa Fanuk developed from here on and the until today, okay? Because first, the automobile industry, you know, arise, right? You have a big demand. And here is the situation in China. You know, 2004, okay, the U.S., uh, you know, car, number of cars produced in the U.S. is about 16 million. China was only 5 million, okay? And of course, back then, just bicycles, no cars, right? <laughs> And the, you know, in short uh, uh, six or seven years, China production of uh, automobile reached the uh, 20 some million. And the U.S. Uh, is, uh, you know, which is almost uh, twice the size of the U.S. market. And uh, that brought a uh, lot of revolutionary change. First, the demand for machine tools. You can see that, uh, you know, China market consumes more than, you know, Japan, Germany, number two, number three, number five, combined, okay? And also lots of the components gets developed, motors, drives, transmission, and the controllers, right? To develop uh, its own machine tool industry. So this is a Chinese local machine tool industry now is top three, Japan, Germany, and China. And also the consumption of industrial robots over the last seven years grow by, if you can't only import it, okay, most of the robots are imported, okay, by 25%, and the Foxconn has some, and also several local manufacturers, that uh, has about 30% growth every year. So we anticipate that, uh, but uh, even with that growth, the density of uh, 10,000 workers, okay, number of robots per 10K worker in the automobile industry is 145, which is a tenth of the density in Japan and the US. So there is still area space for growth. But the next big advantage, I mean, uh, application is not, uh, automobile is great, but I think uh, there is a much bigger one here, is the 3C, okay, so those are the communication, computer, consumer products, wearable devices, right? And they also, automobiles are turning into electric, right? So you have lots of uh, uh, components, products to be uh, manufactured, and uh, these are the components manufacturing, and the, the most important part is assembling, testing, and the packaging. Those are all manual, okay? This industry has a robot density of only 11 robots per 10,000 workers. So it is one-tenth of the auto industry in China. And the, um, yeah, those are the automobile size in China. The Size of the industry is about five million, and those are the requirements. Okay, and for three C industry, the number of workforce is twenty million, and some people say it is even more than this. And those are the units still growing. The requirement is totally different, right? One hundred micron accuracy here, ten to thirty micron, and you have to handle flexible parts, small parts in a confined space, and also the short cycle time. Here you have a year to set up your production line. Here you get only two weeks. So everything has to be set up extremely quickly reconfigured when product change. And the cost requirement is also very different. So none of those uh, big companies robot companies are able to handle this application. So we do see, you know, major suppliers, so those could come from China, could from, come from here, or combination. Okay, so that is the opportunity. So uh, I anticipate that uh, for the next 10 years, you still have at least 30% uh, growth per year, okay, for the next 10 years. Okay. So that is uh, a lot more than the global supply, just like the machine tool industry. Okay. You know, you probably triple and quadruple the you know, annual supply of industry robots now. And the, I will not uh, go through those, but I like to 
give you a little bit of picture of where I am. So this is Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Dongguan. So those are three areas the size of Silicon Valley. And they, you know, they have now a couple of uh, Fox is here with about uh, 300,000 workers, Flextronics and the, about 20 some million workers, okay, hundreds of uh, factories. So this place is called uh, the Hollywood of Makers. Okay. Uh, Vijay Kumar was there and uh, that uh, was uh, after he saw a couple of uh, factories. We have uh, design companies that uh, you have an idea he can turn the design for you. And we have lots of shops, uh, factories uh, producing prototypes and a small batch. And the large quantity, you know, like uh, Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, uh, they all do it there. And the components, you can buy all kinds of inexpensive components. And the logistics, and also if you want to set up your factory, you can do it very quickly because there are so many experienced workers and also management team. So, and of course, uh, another thing is that if you want to do this, you have to have access to low cost, high quality components, okay? So I think, I believe those are all components you need to build any kinds of robots, okay? We have, I think, over the years, uh, you know, developed uh, such a supply chain system, some from our own and some our partners. So this we can make accessible if you want to do something, you know, interesting. And of course, from that, you can you know, improve in the traditional machines, the medical, healthcare robots, uh, industry robots of new generation, autonomous system, and also consumer robots. So we do see a ecosystem being developed over there for massive uh, manufacturing of uh, you know, large quantities of uh, stuff. And the machine tool industry or equipment industry in China is about 200 billion the size. And the medical, those you know, the size of those industry. So we are also ex establishing, you know, the university see the benefits of what I'm doing. So wants to scale up the process. So we are also trying to establish an institute of robotics over there, and they also our, you know. Uh, aim is to from the teaching, the research, and the, then the entrepreneurship, you know, just the one straight uh, shop. And the, it will be, uh, we have a few faculty opening, and the students here interested, do make sure to contact me. Okay. So, and also, this is the size we are planning. And the, um, we are also working with. Uh, Dongguang and also Shenzhen government to establish an incubation center, okay? And they also, you know, a kind of uh, research facility bridging university research and the product, the marketplace, okay? So if you have a good idea, okay, and also we can supply, uh, you know, because uh, if you run startup, you have a few founders, you need to recruit a lot more engineers. Okay, so that uh, from the growth experience of DJI, you know, we hired probably 300 engineers in one year. So that we have an ecosystem to do that. And so, you know, you can start a project fit into the incubation center and the, we provide all those supporting service. Okay, like uh, to help you establish a company, perhaps uh, if you have a headquarter in Pittsburgh and you have a subsidiary over there and they take advantage of that, you know, facility, the legal, IP, all those, and the prototyping, all those, uh, and the angel fund. And uh, actually, I'm working with the angel fund from Taiwan, from China, and also Silicon Valley. So I think uh, they all going to be converged over there. So that is the, um, St structure. So we have uh, you know, internal startup, university teams, and also we have uh, you know, lots of uh, partners and the collaboration perhaps uh, with uh, here. So if you have a team, you have ideas, you, can, you want to first uh, do some further development, we can do that. And also we can have, you know, allow, you know, provide access to the components which is so critical for doing anything that uh, you, know, you can massively commercialize. 
So the scenario is an uh, individual you are interested, you, you know, we can help you to build up a team so you can develop the technology, provide the funding support and also the components and also introduce other tenants, you know, talents into your group and you have a startup team over there. And if you have a team already, you have your own fund, that is also you know, much easier to do. So that is the scenario. And I think I just got my time right. OK, thank you very much. So we have 15 minutes for questions. <coughs> yes. So at the very end of your talk, you, you spoke about this uh, incubator uh, at your robotics institute to be uh, that incubator it's for local or is it for anyone in the world yeah the incubator is built in joint with the uh, you know the agency the government in Shenzhen and the Dongguan it is not only for the institute at HKUST, but also for robotics uh, fans and the research all over the world you know, wants to take advantage of the ecosystem, the components industry there. Okay, so if I were to invent a new, say, robot bank robber, because yeah. uh, you know bank robbing is very unsafe, uh, we, I can come with you. I can come to you. And, so the second question is the, the funding for the startup companies, like the, like the DJI. So where did the, where did that funding come from? Okay, so the. Um, Startup process in that part of uh, you know what we are doing is a little different from what you do in the Silicon Valley. Okay, in Silicon Valley, if you have a good idea, angels are you know they are ambitious. They can put in a big chunk of money, right? You just burn the money. If it runs out, runs out. And when we do it, we want the funding team to first put in your pocket money to you know take a, move forward a couple of steps. You have a prototype or you have an initial product because the cost there is much, much less than the cost here. And that is possible. And with that, then the angel funds all over, they can invest, you know, to, for quantity production or for scale up. But, but the angel funds. Are and the government can, pro government provides the angel funds. But the source of the angel funds is it Chinese citizens? No, 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 no. In fact, they encourage uh, overseas talents, whether you are Chinese or you are you know, non-Chinese. Welcome. No, yeah. I'm sorry, so, but, but the angel funds that, yeah. that like, they, like DGI have yeah. obtained, yeah. were those local from China or were they internationals? Now you, you can see the Sequoia and also those uh, you know, big venture funds are also you know, uh, reaching there. And do you help broker? Yeah, I can have uh, help uh, to, uh, with local or international angel funds. One last question. So one of the things they tell us here in America is that the intellectual property protection in China is not as robust as it is in the United States. And so there's this fear of, of going over there and then, and then losing the idea. In fact, we have our collaborators in China tell us the same thing. Yep. So I was wondering how you handle Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this uh, has uh, been changing slowly. Okay. Like uh, 10 years ago, the nature of the industry in China is ODM, OEM. So then it is, you know, people don't do research, don't do, you know, design themselves. So they just either copy or either take order. But now I think uh, this kind of practice is no longer easy. It's much, much more difficult. Government are cracking and also people recognize this is not the model for the country to follow. So now, like a DJI and a few those uh, companies, and they, you know, they, we do file lots of patents. And they, we also see some copy ones, but uh, you know, that is uh, very different from 10 years ago. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, any questions? <coughs> Okay, so if you have questions, please come to the front and we can communicate with each other.